uh, welcome on this uh, this beautiful Monday morning in March, in springtime. And today's video is going to be a long one. Some of you might find it boring. Some of you might find it offensive. Some of my, you might find it liberating. And some of, my, some of you might find it a load of shite. But <clears throat> today's video is going to be a long one. And I want to discuss what's happening to me personally at the moment. So many people have contacted me saying, Thomas, how do I become a pagan? Inevitably followed by, is there a book I can read? Okay. Now, first of all, there is no book of paganism and there's no book you can read that can make you a pagan. The simple fact is we are not people of the book as the Muslims call Christians, Jews and Mohammedans. Therefore, they can kill us at will. And uh, we are a spoken word tradition that's highly archetypal <clears throat> and metaphorical in nature that does not <clears throat> convert people. So therefore, we don't have to have a book saying this is how you must become a pagan. And that's why this video goes out with the cravat, caveat, sorry, cravat, <laughs> caveat, that, uh, uh, it's Monday morning, sorry, that this is not conversion because we don't convert people. What religion you are is your own bloody business and it's nothing to do with me and I'm not here to tell you you're right or wrong or to convert you. In fact, one of the, the reasons why paganism was wiped off the face of the earth was because we were too tolerant of other religions and I will be re re recommending books you can read to help you but they won't make you a pagan, okay? Now, firstly, just get rid of that notion of becoming a pagan. This is very important. You don't become a pagan, you are a pagan. If, unless your ancestry is from the Middle East and Semitic, and even then you can go back far enough, you'll find that you're a pagan. That's why paganism is, is, is actually really taking off in, in Israel. You can go further back. We're well, just talking in the European and the European diaspora sense here, okay? Uh, your ancestry was pagan. Your, your DNA is pagan. You and your ancestors became Christians almost certainly by force, and you're not becoming something. What you're doing is you're stripping away uh, the skin of a falsehood that has been foisted upon your ancestors for the better part of 1500 years, but it could be less. Because we can remember, the Middle Ages is a very strange period of history. We, it's, it was completely rewritten by evangelist monks and Christian scholars. scholars, And uh, to basically create this notion that Europe became Christian peacefully and willingly. And the old pa pagan religions just died away. And that's why they had, you know, what was it? Seven Crusades. We won't talk about that. Now... <clears throat> So invariably, everyone says to me, what book do I read? Well, there's no book. My first, my answer to that is, go for a walk in the forest alone at night. Go for a walk along the beach alone at sunset. Communicate with nature. Now remember, we're not Wiccans. We're not a nature-based religion. Paganism is just as easily adaptable, like Hinduism is, to the high-tech urban landscape of the modern world as it is to the ancient forests of Europe. It's very important. If you want to know what Europe would, what, what, what paganism would be like today, think of all the Hindus who work in IT. They haven't abandoned their Hinduism. They still celebrate the valley and all the Hindu festivals and their wives wear bindis and some men wear bindis too. And uh, that's what it would be like. That's what it would, we would, we would be just another religion you would be aware of today in the modern world and it would have adapted and changed of course over the centuries but fundamentally it would be like hinduism anyway it comes from the same common root the indo-european roots now so that's the first thing i would say the second thing i would say is that <clears throat> stay away from anything to do with neo-paganism Neo-paganism is a branch of Judaism. I'm not knocking Judaism, by the way. In fact, I, ha I have a lot of sympathy for what has been done to Jews by Christians over the centuries. And uh, so, and Muslims, what they've done to, to, to Jews. So uh, that's a complex story too. And it's one that actually 
doesn't get talked about because of certain kind of Nordic pag pagan groups are full of neo-Nazis and so on. And they don't want to acknowledge real history. So they make up kind of like their own, like they, they bring their own bigotries and hatreds into it and mix it up with ignorance. But there's, a, there's another story there as well. We'll, we'll just, we'll be, we'll, be tip, we'll be tapping into that along the way. So what was I going to say? So you meet people who call themselves Wiccans and they're pagans. They're not pagans. Wicket, Wicket was written by Alistair Crowley and disseminated by Gerald Gardner. And it was a very brilliant and clever plan by these two genius men. Uh, what they did was they, and Doreen, uh, Dion Fortune, another great person, took it, was also part of this as well. What they did was, on the, on the cusp of the legalization of witchcraft in England, i.e. the abolition of the English witchcraft laws in the late, early, late 1940s, early 1950s, when in the UK, witchcraft laws started to be taken off the statute books. They knew that there was going to be an explosion of witchy poos in the UK, mainly among the aristocrats who would be performing their little spells, just like, and they would cause all the havoc and mayhem they had caused, just like when they got involved in spiritualism a hundred years, well, sixty odd years previous. And so they devised a thing called this Wiccan, this book, this book of Wicca, the Wicca Road. And it was a way of keeping these people away from real magical schools such as Thelema and the OTO. And it also was good because it kept them away from paganism as well. But it had them believing that because of Gardner's made up story that he saw these pagan community living in the New Forest in England, that it was pagan. You're not a pagan if you, if you, if you, if you are a, a Wiccan. You're Jewish. You're Jewish in the same way the Chaldees were still Jewish. They, you're you're a go between. You're trying. You're not even bringing people into paganism. You're creating a kind of a parachute. And a lot of Nordic paganism is full of this. So be and this is a general warning to stay away from anything to do that's churchy congregational paganism. Like Hindus, pagans were not a congregational people. They had feast days. They had festivals. They had venerations and rites and rituals that took place around things like holy wells and stuff like that, or sacred mountains. That's where the climb on Krog Patrick comes to. That's an ancient pagan thing that the Christians stole from us. And uh, it was a veneration of, of the, the Krom god, the last pagan god of Ireland. But uh, you'll see gonna be, this is going to be appearing a lot in this, this video, this kind of, you know, co-option thing. And... Uh, so you know you have all these 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 uh, people going along saying like I'm a I'm a pagan. Oh, what are you into? I'm in Druidry. I worship Lilith. You know Lilith is a Jewish a Jewish figure. You know uh, this kind of nonsense. And then they try to say, oh, I'm into Baphomet. Well, Baphomet's an interesting one. We don't Baphomet may be a Christian invention. We don't know. Ultimately, it's a re imagination of you see he only really shows up when the the knights templars are being uh are being tortured and i think baphomet might have been used for some knights templars who are probably indulging in paganism or pagan revivalism and were worshiping pan and baphomet may be a reimagination of the pagan god pan the the, the god of wild places and fertility very common god all throughout Europe. And we'll find this too, that you're, if you're a pagan and say you're an Irish pagan, you're not a xenophobic parochial tit tithead. An Irish pagan could just as easily worship, and when I say worship or venerate is a better word, is something like Baal, which is probably where Beltane or Beltana came from, Beltane as the English, speaker, English speakers call it. And uh, there's a very interesting history there and that may have been later on merged into St. John's Eve. But that's true to Roman Empire. Gods from different different areas were venerated inside their pantheon. By meaning when that by mean by that meaning, when say an Irish pagan heard of, or an English pagan Brit, a Britain British pagan, I wouldn't mean no English to back then, or a Gaulish pagan heard about Pan, they might have said, Oh, okay, that's pretty cool, I like him. And incorporated it into the pantheon of existing gods. So they didn't throw away Krom, or they didn't throw away Thor, they didn't throw away Freya, uh, or all. They, they, they incorporated 
into it, but it was still a pagan thing. It wasn't something completely different, which is what Christianity was. Now, so that may have been the origins of Baphomet, okay? Now, other things, another one you stay miles away from is any motherfucker calling himself a druid. Stay well away from these types. There are no druids left. Now, there are people I that I know some of them who are genuinely studying and trying to promote druidry. And they're all right, those people. I've no problem with them. But they can't, they're not in a position to be saying they're actually druids. Uh, because the tradition is family lineage. That's another thing, you know, whether they were male or female, they were passed down through family lineages. Because blood, remember what I was saying about, like, sanguinosis? Where do you think I got that from? Okay. And it's possible in the past that some of them had ancestors who were probably druids. I haven't got a problem with that. But it, it, I'm talking specifically about the type of, not so much like, say, the average guy or woman who has a local druidry study group. I have no problem with them. And uh, maybe even if they wear a, sta a, 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 a cape and have a staff to sort of illustrate in a story kind of way, in a kind of a bardic way, I have absolutely no problem with that. I think it's quite a, a nice thing. And if, you know, that's, that's their own business, you know. But the ones who call, you see at Stonehenge, the ones who call themselves the Lord Master of the Druids and all this stuff, they're just all Freemasons. And they're a bunch of toffs play acting. And it's, you know, the ones who are all dressed in white that go to Stonehenge and all those types. Uh, you know, th that's all bol that's all bollocks, that is. Total, complete bollocks. And it comes from a kind of a Victorian cosplay LARPing thing. That's where that comes from. It's nothing to do with anything authentic. Nothing at all. And, uh, and again, if that's your thing, that's your own business. I'm not trying to convert you. But don't be following those, you know, the British Order of Druids or the the Wiccans and thinking you're involved in paganism. You all certainly are not, okay? So how do you become a pagan? Like I said, you go for a, a communication with nature. But this is one of the fallacies about paganism in that it's a nature-based religion. Not necessarily. It's part of, it's a big part of it because so many of the archetypal forces and metho metaphorical entities derived within paganism come from experiences in the natural world and archetypes and representations of the natural world the call it a nature-based religion is a very simplistic thing there are many aspects to paganism one of them is reincarnation that's a universal the accepted thing among all pagan groups as it is for hindus is that you have reincarnation now you don't have the same you do have you do have a class system it, it, the Breton laws have the same class system as uh, the Hindus regarding you know there was untouchables they were called mugs and stuff like that now you could look at this from a socialist point of view and say that's terribly unfair okay or from a Christian point of view where all men and women are created equal I'm telling you for a fact right now all men and women are not created equal and all men and women are not, you know, you know, beloved in the eyes of, of any God. They're, the world is full of psychopaths, scumbags, lowlifes, the human waste and dregs. And people who find themselves at the bottom of pagan societies, it's usually a result of their ancestors being a rapist, a murderer, a pedo or something like that. Or they lost it. They, they went to war and lost it. And you will find that just like in Hinduism, the whole thing of the caste system is, is shown to be... In Hindu, there's not. If you want to go study to be an IT person in Europe from the Untouchables, no one will stop you. That will not happen in Hindu. No one will stop you in India from doing that. Other than say you live in the most backward community in some the arse end of like you know, you know, not even Kerala, up around uh, Kashmir, right? Otherwise. If you want to make something of your life, just like that the mugs wanted to make, or the, the thralls in in Nordic society, they also had a class system the same way too. It wasn't a class system, it was a social hierarchy system. The, what happened was the British weaponized this, the caste system in India because it suited them very well. So don't, you know, they're very complicated things. Don't be thinking about them in black and white. It's like, oh, it's everyone should be a socialist and given the same thing in life. Mm, even the founding fathers of America didn't believe that. You were given an opportunity. Being given an opportunity in life is your 
a chance to make your monomyth, okay? Now, things like the slave trade were definitely a result of Christianity. In fact, the Bible was used to justify the slave trade for many decades after it should have been abolished. And they used things like the Book of Ham. They said the people had wider noses and darker skins, and therefore they were lesser in the eyes of God, Jehovah, Yahweh. And that was used to justify... So pagans would have never had slaves like that based on skin. They would have had slaves based on... And I'm not saying we do it today. I'm just saying this is what it was in the past. Remember, this is... I'm talking about how paganism is today. Just like Christians today have a diff, don't have slavery, neither would pagans today have slavery. I'm just saying the legacies of the... When I say... Be, you know, how to become a pagan. I don't mean going back to live as you were in the 5th or 6th century. The world has moved on in so many ways. I'm talking about how to live it now, okay? So a fundamental thing is that, like, this whole thing of, like, uh, all men are created equal is totally abhorrent to paganism. This whole thing that, like, all men are equal in the eyes of God. No, pagans fully accept that there are evil, wicked people in this world. And they are an abomination. They're an abomination not to God, but to natural law. They disrupt the cycles of natural law, whether in a family, in a community, in a tribal structure, or in a nation. They re recognize these things, and they don't base their, their, their dislike of these people on their skin color or their religion. They base it purely upon their behavior. This is why no redemption is possible. If you're a rapist, a murderer, a pedophile in paganism, your throat gets thrown, slit, and you're thrown into a bog, okay? And the reason why you're thrown into the bog is you're cast into the abyss so you can never reincarnate. That's very different than all sinners must can find redemption. Can John Wayne, Dem John Wayne Gacy find redemption? Can Hillary Clinton find redemption? Can Tony Blair find redemption? These people are monstrous, not because they're against religious statutes and laws, but because their behaviors and the actions of them, what they've done were totally in violation of natural law. There is no murder of people in natural law for fun. There is murders and killings and there's the destruction of life in order for survival. You know, animals eat each other in this kind of thing for resources, but that's not done out of vindictiveness or for pleasure or for politics. Very, very important, okay? So therefore, this whole thing of like, uh, you know, you know, when you hear these Wiccans going on about all is one, universal love, that's a purely Christian idea. And it's, the reason for that is for conversions. And it also exists in Islam. And the thing is, it's only universal love if you're on their team. Otherwise, they take you out. This is why jihad and crusade exists, okay? You know that movie, it's a wonderful movie, uh, East is East, from about 20 years ago, about a Pakistani family living in, in uh, a, mixed Pakist a mixed English Pakistani family living in the north of England in the early 1970s. And... Um, the father is, is pissed off at the, the one of the older sons one, because he's hanging out and he's, he wants to. He's a rock star. He's like a really good-looking young guy, and he's going to nightclubs and he's dancing to Deep Purple and stuff like that. Straight, there's a great scene where he walks into the nightclub in Birmingham dancing to "Strange Kind of Woman" by Deep Purple. But it showed like that was that. That's what a that's what a pagan would be. A pagan wouldn't consider that sinner's music. A pagan would walk. That's what was happening to him. He was going back to his pagan, you know, his pagan soul, pre-Islam. And he was walking into the nightclub in Birmingham, the strain, I want you, I need you, I gotta be near you. It's just that's what a pagan would do. You know, he was breaking from the people of the books. And his father's angry at him and he goes, you know, why you want to be like this? In Islam, all men created equal. All men, no black, no white, no yellow, all men same. But the 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 the, the thing the thing in there that you have to hook your think your mind to is he goes, in Islam you see, in Islam, they're all created equal. Malcolm X found that out, okay? And I'm a great fan of Malcolm X. But that was the whole thing. In Islam, you're all equal if you're a Muslim. But if you're not, you're, you're an infidel. And that's, that was a very telling line in that wonderful movie. But uh, where a pagan doesn't look at a Christian and go, dickhead. Or doesn't look at a Muslim and go, following it. It just doesn't care. Pagans don't care about what, what, what your other religion is. It's irrelevant to us. This is why the Roman Empire was incredibly tolerant. They didn't care what... This is why Romans adopted pagan gods and pagans adopted Roman gods such as Minerva and Celtic 
people adopted the, the Roman pagan god Minerva. They didn't care. It was all a path to the same magical view of reality and the universe. And all the gods and goddesses ultimately represented, ultimately represented, you know, metaphorical, but also if you want to take them literal, that was fine as well, and allegorical and archetypal representations of forces in the natural world, the cosmos, and in human psychology within you, okay? Read your Joseph Campbell, Hero of a Thousand Faces. Now, so that's how you become a pagan. Now, other parts of pagans is, is a belief. One of the reasons I'm anti-science is because science today is purely, it's purely Middle Eastern. It's purely Abrahamic. And this is where the whole thing comes along. The scientific method comes from. And they're wrong. They're completely wrong. Now, I'm not saying the scientific method is wrong, but they're, you know, we have this disaster today where science is political. I saw a thing, like these I fucking love science things, are now, that, that, that website is now showing transgendered warriors who were found in ancient time. How are they transgender? They had long hair. And this is, what's, this is why science today must be abolished and we must return back to natural philosophy. Science today is purely corrupt and run by governments and corporations. And that's, the, that's because he who pays the piper calls the tune. But it's also an Abrahamic thing. Now, and the reason for that is it's very simple. Science, to an ancient pagan, science and magic was the same thing. And here's an example of it. You, uh, you have a situation where you're a Roman engineer and you're told we have water in the Tyrolean Alps. We don't have water in this part of northern Italy. Can you get the water from the Tyrolean Alps, Alps to northern Italy? And he'll say, sure, we'll build a viaduct. They build a viaduct using engineering arts. They, they build a viaduct using skills that have been developed from observing nature. How does an arch work? How does, you know, how are we able to, how is a keystone can hold colossal amounts of energy and hold up a gigantic arch when two trees fell together and held them up? They found that this area where the two trees were, were meeting were incredibly strong and you could put a hundred men on top of those two fallen trees and they would never go because the keystone in the middle was holding the two. So they discovered, geez, we should build things with that. So they, they came from nature, you see? And so they built this fire duck and that the water is, they know that the water from a higher level in the Alps flows down to the northern Italy part. So they built a descending viaduct from concrete, which they probably discovered through a form of alchemy. And it, it goes from the Tyrolean Alps all the way down. And then suddenly you have agriculture and fresh drinking water in this part of northern Italy. And the engineer would look at that and go, well, there we go. We did it. We made it. And they go, well, what is the force that makes the water travel from the Tyrolean Alps down to down below they go I don't know magic I'm not concerned with that my concern is purely with building the arch I don't care about the underlying uh, forces that behind it they're magic they're the, go the work of the gods but otherwise I know that if I build this arch it would just like a spider will build a spider web a certain shape it's the most efficient shape uh, if birds fly in a V formation in the sky there's less drag on the birds behind them uh, I, what causes that drag? I don't know. The gods. It's not irrelevant. It's the finished product that's, irrele that's relevant. And therefore, we built the viaduct. And the, the magical forces behind gravity, ma mass, stress, fluid dynamics, it's the work of the gods. It's magic. Now, you would, and then imagine scientific pairs go, well, they were so stupid. Well, why are they stupid? Well, they didn't study gravity. Okay, you tell me what gravity is today. You don't know. Because even today, Science cannot fully explain the gravitational force and what actually there's theories regarding gravitons and stuff, but they can't actually explain it. Therefore, it's in the world of wait for it magic. Okay, so the unknown forces, rather than to be understood and conquered, a pagan scientific mind adapts them and use them in a practical way. And you could say, you, and all these I fucking love science, well, that's backward superstition. Okay, what's quantum physics? What's the placebo effect? 
my friends, it's magic, okay? And rather than pulling their hairs out trying to understand how the gods operated, they worked with the gods to get things done. And this is the primary reason this obsession with a cold, hard, materialistic universe, especially in the last 50 years in terms of how it's entered materialistic science through scientism, is the main reason we've had almost no scientific pro pro progress since probably the 1960s. Everything else since then has been a miniaturization, but it's been nothing. It's been nothing new. Nothing new has been invented. Yet we're still we're still basically living the same way we were in the 1950s, just with more refined versions. Your smartphone, this thing is ultimately a telephone. You know, it's just been changed. It's a TV and a telephone combined into one. That's basically what it is, an alarm clock. And uh, yes, it's been technologically remarkable. But it's just refinements of pre-existing technologies. Nothing new has been really invented because it is scientific scientism creep into into modern science to the point now where they've gone insane, and they're they, you know they, they they say things like there was no ice age scare in the nineteen seventies. It was one newspaper. Oh no no, they were teaching kids ice uh, oncoming ice age classes in schools all over the world. It was everywhere. It's all politically driven now. It's now climate change. It's now global warming. It's now transgender ancient warriors. Why? Because the Abrahamic mind has completely taken over science. They've become intolerant of anything outside the, the pale of, of, of absolute. That's why these people also who go to these megalithic sites and talk about the druidic yard or the meg megalithic measurement. Those people did not ever sit down and measure hard measure things. They went with nature. When the, we now we now find these Roman roads that are dead straight were almost certainly built by the Celtic tribes, particularly the Gauls and the Teutonic tribes in uh, in, in Germany. What the, and they didn't go, they didn't build straight lines. They found the straight path Be, for efficiency. And the Romans came along and paved them over and claimed that they'd built them. The Romans were clever too. I'm not putting the Romans down, by the way. But we know that you know the, the history is written by the victors, and. Uh, so your measurement mind of hard science, you know, the God, you must learn to, not must learn, part of being a pagan is the belief that the gods move in mysterious ways. I will be reincarnated and born again. The wor There's no such thing as any pagan who says, I believe in unconditional love is not a pagan. The only thing you have unconditional love for is your child from the moment they're born until the moment they leave the home because you have to take care of them and raise them properly. After that, it becomes conditional love. Pagan mythologies and stories are full of conditional love. You know, you know, not uncondi unconditional love is part of the one world multicultural bullshit crap we're being foisted today. We don't, we're all different. We're all very, we may be human beings and how our bodies function, and we may be human beings in terms of like we should respect one another regardless of race or ethnic origin or whatever, nationality. But we're not all the same. Even within your own family, they're not all the same. There's good people and there's bad people. That's how pagans view humanity. That's an important one. Because they will, they will see a bunch of refugees coming in where the Christian... Abrahamic woke mind. Remember, woke woke is a new form of Christian evangelicism. Remember that. That's why the book burn. Cancel culture is the same thing as book burning and stuff like that. And uh, witch hunts of the past. So the woke. Uh, I, I just find it funny that all these Christians and wokies are all fighting one another. Yet they're coming from the same Abrahamic mindset. Uh, a, a pagan would never ban a book. A pagan would look at a bunch of refugees coming off a ship and go, okay. Which is the smart one? Which is the good one? Which is the nice one? Which is the bad one? Which is the one who'll rape my wife? Which is the one who'll be a great guy who'll do good things for this village? Which is the one who's a great woman who'll cook new foods that we've never tasted before? Show me them. And then show me the ones who are assholes and we, we, won't, we won't have them. But no, we live in a world today where governments say, come on in, all in, rapist and scientist. You're all welcome. And then we'll solve the problem later on after, you know, there's been mass social disasters. And that's an Abrahamic Christian mind. That's exactly what that is. 
that you know we just we just that when when politicians are bringing huge numbers of people into your country it's basically christian evangelicism that's why all you jesus heads who are so hung up on i'm fighting the new world order the the, old, the first new world order was christianity now let's talk about that a little bit okay when the Roman Empire collapsed, when sorry, when it was teetering on the edge, it took it had great difficulty maintaining its margins, its borders. Oh wow, doesn't that sound a bit like Ukraine? And on the fringes of the empire, in order to maintain order, whether it was in the forest, the Teutonberg Forest of Germany, whether it was in Britain with the Iceni in Essex and stuff like that, and the other Celtic tribes throughout Britain, whether it was in the Middle East among the Semitic tribes, they had great difficulty maintaining law and order. Now, they didn't go to these places and convert anyone to paganism. The Jews still worshipped Jews, and all the other groups, the Zoroastrians and the Hindus and the, and the pagans of Europe, they all were a little left alone. But there was, it was very difficult as the, as the empire expanded to maintain its frontiers. It was being attacked. It was being, you know, the tr like Boadicea, Boudicca, and the the Teutonic tribes and the Jews in the Middle East quite rightly saw that the Roman Empire is in the shit. <clears throat> it doesn't have the money. They would have noticed this thing by there wasn't the same amount of money coming in. Like the the, the soldiers wouldn't have been as the, as good recruits, as well fed, and as well, you know, and so on as previous ones. The the army would have looked shoddy. The bureaucracy would have become shoddy. And so they would have seized opportunities for uprisings, okay, to try and rid the place of the Romans. Not because they were different religion, except in the case of the Jews, but maybe, who knows, but definitely in the case of they wanted to run their own affairs. <clears throat> in fact, the, the Jewish rabbis and the Roman empires had a very good working relationship uh, during the time of the occupation. It was seen as beneficial to both communities because the the rabbis, because Judaism is not an evangelical religion, doesn't convert, and the Romans, Pontius Pilate and so on, just had a working relationship with them. I don't care what God you worship, once you don't, you know, raise an army or start or stop paying taxes, and this kind of thing. And so, in, in, in Judea, when you had the Jewish revolt, it was a catastrophic failure. It resulted in the... the the, the temple in Jerusalem being wrecked, ravaged and, and sacked. And it led to other things like disenfranchised groups. By the time the it all ended, Masada and everything, you had disenfranchised Jewish groups living predominantly in what we call Syria today. This would have been, there were sects and, sects and communities. And we hear about things like the Essenes and the Zealots, you've heard of them, but there were many other, like the Maccabeans and others, that they lived in the the fringes of Judea. They lived in a world of nowhere. The Orthodox Judaism didn't want them because of all the trouble they started. And also mainstream pagan society had rejected them because of all the trouble they got up to. And they, they, they lived in this miasmic world on the border of what what we call today Syria, the Syrian desert that was part of today part of everywhere from Lebanon up to eastern Turkey. And they we're a, we're a kind of a, a, genu, a, a, a generally very mixed bunch, but we're in them a myth formulated that this guy, this fictional character, almost certainly fictional, but who, who fully knows? We have to remember that at the time that Jesus existed in Jerusalem, there were 11 other messiahs officially listed, and he wasn't one of them, funny enough. But uh, there was a belief that this guy Jesus had, well, he was the messiah, and he represented a new way for Judaism to survive. It would survive by becoming evangelical. By that I mean proselytizing non-Jews, Gentiles, and bringing them into the Jewish world in order to grow Judaism. Now, these were also very clever people as well. They were not, they, they, there was like guerrilla monkey types. They were like literally just troglodytes in the desert. There was also among them very intelligent people that had to have been in order for the success they gained in the decades to come. Now they the first the first assault upon paganism was the attack at the, the temple of Athena in Palmyra in Syria. Now these were just hammer wielding thugs came out of the out of the desert, the Syrian desert, and smashed up the temple. Uh, they burned all the books, 
and so on. Now it was the Palmyra wasn't just a, a temple to Athena. It was also a um, an actual what you call it university and place like that of, of, of learning a simple a greek a classic greek, greek symposium really and um terrified terrorized the christian the roman world they were seen as being the isis of their time they were terrified of them and they also started to recruit other disenfranchised groups from around the same region until the point there was quite a lot of them and they started to infiltrate Rome and main sea society. So therefore you had the burning of Rome by Christians who were actually Jews in the, during the time of Nero and so on. They were the ISIS, they, they were the terrorist group within. Now this guy called Constantine eventually came along and he recognized that these guys would be good for the army uh, because they're not afraid of death because they think they're going to see their Jesus after they die. So he met down. He met with these 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 rabbis. Now remember, they weren't priests; or they were rabbis. They were Jewish. They were Jews who just believed in proselytization, conversion, and um, the first great act of this was to Christianize the Roman legions. And how they did this was they took the pre-existing Mithra myths, which was a Persian sort of Bucranian bolt cult cult that came out of the Middle East and was uh, from Persia, sorry, and was incorporated into the Roman pantheon, particularly among the army and the military. And he was born on Christmas Day, what we call Christmas Day. He was born to a virgin, and he <laughs> it was Chris, it was the Jesus story, and they dovetailed it into Judaism. And we had really what became the first version of Christianity. So paganism plus Judaism. Mithraism became the first and ver version of Christianity, and uh, it became very successful. And so this is why Constantine in fully encouraged and passed laws to stop. You see, Christianity had been made illegal because of all the terrorist events that took place under. You know, they were. I remember we were ISIS now, and uh, he. That was all. Eventually, they they undid the whole Christian taboo thing and brought it in it would be like if the u.s army today became muslims don't say it couldn't happen uh, the way things are going and um uh, it became the religion of the army and then the religion of the statutes and then the religion of the lawmakers now the christians begged and begged now remember they were calling them christians but they were, they were they were rabbis and stuff like that they begged the uh, the Romans for tolerance. They're saying you give tolerance to all the pagan religions. Why not? And they say, but you're blowing, you're burning down cities. You're you, you attacked the Temple of Tamar. You killed Hypatia and burned the Library of Alexandria. You expect us to respect you? And they beg for tolerance and said we'll behave ourselves. But as soon as they got into power, they started a murderous rampage against the pagans. So, so that you know that's how it really. That's how that the reason why you're a Christian today is because of devious bastards around the time of Constantine, who pretended they were going to be wonderful citizens of Rome, but went in there with the, the, with the, with the objective of destroying it. And which, oh God, the, the, if you read the horrors, we'll talk about that in a bit, of what went on in the early days of, of Christianity when it took power. Now, Constantine didn't become a Christian. When he died, a, a monument was commissioned to him, which shows him performing a sacrifice in the temple of Jupiter in Rome. Uh, he just became a facilitator. And you'll find that time and time again, like King Lyra here in Ireland, he didn't become a Christian, but his sons did. This kind of thing. Uh, th there's a transitional period. It's very interesting. Now, it's, I mean, I could probably hear for 10 hours uh, talking about this. I'm, I'm just trying to keep it as brief as possible. Now, the word sacrifice the reason why you why Christians think the word sacrifice is burning babies is because of Jewish propaganda regarding Molech, a Carthaginian god, also worshipped in part of the Middle East, where the 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 Talmus, the Talmudists said that uh, he babies were born to them. Could have been possible, maybe not. Roman propaganda says it was, but Roman propaganda made it lies about wicker men and stuff like that. We know it's not true now. And this is wartime propaganda. 
And the same thing happened with the, when the Jews were captured and taken prisoner into Persia. They wrote all these things about they sacrificed their own babies. But the irony of that is, it seems to be that actually it might have happened in Gehenna, which was the, for, the, the beginning of Judaism, the, the Valley of Gehenna, where the old kings of Israel used to sacrifice the babies. So it's funny, it's almost like a projection of their own past or something like that on the pagans. Now, when a pagan talks about sacrifice, they're not talking about throwing a baby into a fire or killing a virgin on an altar. The word sacrifice means a transference of something you have to someone else or something else in order to get the grace of the gods. Charisma, okay? So, therefore, if you have a few extra quid and you have you see a homeless person on the street, throw them 20 euros. I do it all the time. Uh, a Christian would say, the Christian mind would say, there, there are many charities, that, that's all charities are all Abrahamic, that's why I never give you money to charities. There are many charities out there who will, you know, gladly take care of these people for you. you don't, don't be giving them money, they'll spend it on booze and alcohol. And his attitude is, I don't give a fuck what he spends the money on, or she spends the money on. I'm giving them 20 euros, and then what they do with that, if they buy heroin, if they buy whiskey, or they buy a sandwich, or a fish and chips, that's none of my business, Okay. That money, that was sac the moment of sacrifice, that, that's not the same thing as a charity. We'll give you money if. That's here. That's a sacrifice, okay? I could have used that 20 to buy a few beers, do anything, you know? But I gave it to them. And that's sacrifice, okay? Sacrifice is different than praying. Praying is a welfare system. Please, baby Jesus, if you do this, I'll do that. If I do this, will you do this for me? Pagans don't think that way. Pagans do it without expecting a reward because they know under the actual conditions of natural law that the, the reward will come. You could actually hand money to a very poor family to take care of them, right? When one of those kids grows up, he goes, you know, old man Jimmy down the road, when we were kids after my father died in the car crash, he gave us a thousand pounds and allowed my mother to buy us uh, f to get us started and get us off our feet and I'm a millionaire today because of that guy Jimmy down there and Jimmy's 75 and he goes and knocks on Jimmy's door he says Jimmy do you remember when you gave my mother a thousand quid well I'm a multi-millionaire now I'll buy a house whatever you want it's, see that's natural law it's not charity it doesn't come with a, a you know with, with a clause that's how pagans are I give money to them on the street because I know the laws of the natural law will, will actually bring it back. I know it's called natural law, but it's just how the universe works. So that's another part of paganism. So you stop praying and you start sacrificing. Okay. It's, it's you know, you know, I'm in really big trouble. I can't pay my rent. I'll pray for you. Even though you have a million bucks in the, in the, in the, in the bank. How about paying the fuckers rent? sacrificing some of the money you have to pay the poor bastard's rent. Da no, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Right. Now, so that's, that's, that's another one as well. And again, the belief in magic, the belief in reincarnation. And when they say communication with nature, what they really mean is natural law. Now, another bunch of Christians, another bunch of pagans you need to stay away from are congregational, you know, churchy pagans this is all over the nordic stuff they're all they're building they're building pagan temples all over the place it's pure lutherism it's pure churchy that's all that is okay it's congregationalism yeah it's okay to celebrate a blot now and again or show up with people are like-minded but also you know it's it's churchy there's no you know there's the look at the hindus are a great yardstick the hindus go to the temple to 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 sacrifice and to venerate certain gods or goddesses so that's what we would do you know the temple would not exist as a place where there's a fucker standing at the top going you must do this here's the ten commandments you better do this you know you know peace be upon him no there's no one in the church the only place that's in the sacred place are the sacred for a pagan or a hindu to have a fella in there or a woman saying you must do this would be considered extremely profane. Who the hell are you to actually go between me and the gods? The purpose of the, the, of the, the priests and inside the, the 
oh, Roman temples was the manufacture was to was administrative in function. It was to administer, but they didn't have masses. Okay, they didn't have you go to mass every week, and you didn't have abominations like confessions. Okay. You didn't have to confess because natural law would take something. If you rob somebody, eventually the police would find out and you get caught. Okay, you don't need a priest, you know. And that's uh, this is another one. All these Irish uh, uh, Jesus types, you know, Christ Catholic types saying, "I'm an, I'm an Irish proud Catholic rebel," and then they sing the Croppy Boy. You know what the Croppy Boy is about? That song. It's about a priest getting a confession from an Irish rebel on the eve of battle and then giving it to the local British sergeant, a local British officers. It's a warning, do not go to church to confession and tell you, we're going to have a battle at Vinegar Hill tomorrow. That's how the English found out about the, the, the rebels in 1798. They were all going to confession, going, we're going to Vinegar Hill tomorrow, we're going to attack the English. And now where did, where, where did all those Catholic priests who were, who were loyal to nothing else other than the prevailing structure... They went straight to the British administration and told them what was going on with these rebels. And you're and you're mauling your rosary bees while you think you're going to save Ireland. And you can talk about Patrick Pearson. He was a devout Catholic. Yes, he was. He was a great man. Patrick Pearson was a fantastic man. But you read some of his early writings. He talks about that if Lady Gregory or William Butler Yeats had a got to him sooner, he'd probably almost certainly become a pagan. But as says, as things stand, this is okay for me. And what did what did Patrick Pierce spend his life educating people about pagan heroic stories? He knew the power of it, but he also was a very practical man. And I'm sure his his, his Christian faith was was sincere. And that's why I have no problem with someone who has a sincere sincere Christian faith regarding of their origins. That's their own business, okay? Once they don't try to convert me. Okay. Now that's another thing. The Christian destruction of our history. And this is an abomination that you really need to be aware of. You hear, let's talk about someone like St. Colum Kill or St. Columba as he's known in Britain and Scotland. St. Colum Kill was, you th they all came out of monasteries like Lindisfarne and Iona. The way to think of monasteries like Lindisfarne and Iona is think of the Bilderberg Group, the World Economic Forum. He was a Klaus Schwab of his day. His job was to cause the great reset of Christianity over paganism, to build back better. In, with a Bible, the Bible back better. And he came to Ireland and he, uh, you know, he came, he got involved in all sorts of machinations. He would have tons of money given to him by people in, in Rome, from the Roman Empire through Iona, and he'd buy off certain kings. He caused a battle after some assassinations and people had murdered him, had murdered. He caused a battle here in County Sligo over the copyright of a book. Now, this book was an early Christian missal, and this shows you how the church would go to any lengths to write away the past and only have the present. This was a great reset. Paganism was to be wiped out, and new histories of Ireland were to be written, and new mythologies or adapted mythologies. And you have a, a thing called the Battle of the Book. It took place by the Round Tower in 560, I think. In uh, or somewhere around it, don't quote me on that. In County Sligo, the date don't quote me on, and and that's one thing I'm not good at dates. And uh, it led to a battle that had four thousand people dead over the ownership of a Christian manuscript. Why was this manuscript so valuable? Uh, because it may have not been conducive to the church fathers having the pagans, the Christian Irish, finding out about it. So this battle led to 4,000. It was such a disaster that even Christians living in Ireland wanted to excommunicate St. Colum Kill. He was banished to Scotland, where he shows up at the River Ness, the, the estuary of the River Ness in Inverness, banishing a serpent and converting a guy called King Breda, Breda I think was his name, a pagan Pictish king. I can't remember the name now. This is, I haven't read this stuff in decades. But anyway, he converted... That's why the Loch Ness Monster thing is Crowley. Because St. Columba, or Colum Kill, banished... It was specifically noted on the estuary. And what it was talking was the same thing as St. Patrick and the Snakes. Metaphor for pagans, okay? So anyway... 
Then he set about the rest of his life rewriting his history. And that included making himself one of the four evan the three evangelists of Ireland and the only one that was an actual human being that we can put a finger on. We know Breed was St. Brid Saint Bridget Breed was the goddess, a pagan goddess. So she never existed as a Christian saint. And St. Patrick absolutely never existed. He was invented by Ada Sleti, a... Um, an Akronite bishop about 700 years after he's supposed to have existed. That's not even hidden. That's like out there. But, you know, you have to go dig for it. Well, you have to go dig for it. It's on the fucking Wikipedia page, for Christ's sake. Look at Aid of Sleti. Anyway, uh, and, uh, see, it's all out there. It's just like the whole thing with the needlecraft. All the potential dangers were out there. You didn't look. Or you laughed it off. And that's why you're in the mess you are now. Well, the same thing with these things I'm talking about here. It's all out there. Go look for it. And so, you know, they'd rewritten the history of every country. All the countries. And all their mythology. And this is like, look at my, 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 my documentary. Who stole the Allfather. And how Odin came about. And so, this is another thing they did. They, was, they, they had, they would, you think, when you think of like, St. Augustine. St. Colum Kill. Uh, all of them, all the saints, all these Christian evangelist saints. Think of them being, the, you know, Peter Sutherland's, Klaus Schwab's, uh, Bill Gates, causing the great reset of pagan Europe into the Roman, the Roman, the new Roman way of thinking, the post-imperium Roman way of thinking, i.e. the Vatican. And those of you who say, oh, you know, the, the, the Vatican never really came to Ireland until the Normans, it's such a bollocks. Say, uh, have you heard Brian Baru? Who do you think made him emperor of Ireland? The fucking Pope. And also, let's one more, one more quick thing before I get to some book recommendations, not on how to become a pagan, but useful in this discussion, is... Uh, is this whole thing of the early days Celtic mystic Celtic Christianity was was like this wonderful? This is all you all they say you know a fake pagan a fake pagan always tries to hold on to the Jesus thing you know uh, as an insurance policy you know uh, you have the Chaldees you you have the Celtic pagan church what the first the first missile of Ireland talks about the rabbis uh, converting the Gentiles of Ireland does that sound pagan to you the, for, the Celtic church practiced the Sabbath on a Saturday uh, and kept kosher does that sound pagan to you the Celtic church uh, implemented circumcision does that sound pagan to you you know you, you, people say there's a great there's a great video that shows exactly what the Celtic Church in Ireland would look like and in Scotland and in England. It's called the song Tradition in the musical Fiddler on the Roof, who keeps a home, a kosher home, and a Jewish home. The mama, the mama, who keeps the scripts the, who, and teaches all. The rabbi, the rabbi, and your tradition, tradition. You watch that video, fantastic musicals, one of my favourite musicals of... Uh, Fiddler and that's seen tradition. Fiddler in the roof. That's pagan Ireland. That was sorry. That's a, that's that's Celtic church right there. It was purely Jewish. Now the Chaldees would be. You could see them. But well, what about the Chaldees? You know the Chaldees. They were, you know, they were really pagans. You know, pretending. You know, in the Christian world. Yes, they were. They were Christians pretending to be pagans, and pagans pretending to be Christians. They were, the Twitter of their day. The Facebook of their day, they were the ones charged with changing the pagan stories over. And, and you would be cancel cultured if you said, hold on a second, it's not called Crow Patrick, it's called Crow Crumb. It's not named after some guy that doesn't exist. Tradition, tradition, you know, that's what that would have been like. I'm not going to know anything Jewish. I think Jewish is not, I'm, I'm not, I like Judaism. Of the, all the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism is the only one that doesn't force to convert me. It doesn't force to convert me. And that makes Judaism f okay in my book. Uh, there's no jihad and there's no crusade. And you want to think about that one next time you're having a, next time you're, ha you're, blaming, you're blaming Jewish people and everything on your heart for, their, for the problems in your life. That those the Christians and the Muslims were the ones who forced converted your ancestors. Now, uh, the Jews wanted to be left alone. Just like the pagans wanted to be left alone. That's why Jews and pagans never had a problem. Until the Romans and you know that's still, that was a, that was a, that was really an imperialistic thing, and then I came along. Now anyway, so that's how to become a pagan. Communication with nature is not really about like going, oh, I get up at dawn and I collect the dew from the flowers, and you know I go I prance naked in the woods. No, it's understand. Communication with nature is the is the knowing 
the knowing that natural law is the ultimate arbiter of the cosmos and the universe and even yourself, okay? Now, that's what that is, okay? So, therefore, communication with nature is a very important part of that. But it's also a thing of, of practicing, removing, believing, uh, practicing this concept of no, of removing the unconditional love from you. Some people are rotten, and that's okay. Some people can't be redeemed, and it's not your business to try and redeem anyone. Now, that's a big part of it, okay? Another part of it is the belief in magic, that there are mysterious forces of the universe. And if anyone says, that's a load of bollocks, you point out quantum physics, placebo effect. There's still loads and loads of things science hasn't got a clue about. Even these laws of fixed constants have been shown to be bollocks. There is no such thing as the speed of light at that exact speed. The speed of light changed actually back in the early 20th century. And there was one, and they decided that, well, the speed of light didn't change. To mis that we, we recalibrated the instruments. That's measurement. Remember what I said Measurement. Measurement, the measurement mind, you've got to get rid of that, okay? The megalithic yard, all that crap, okay? And seeing pi, there's another one, they're obsessed with pi. The ancient people didn't know about pi, they didn't care about it. They built something that looked beautiful in the right place. And, it, and you know this whole thing has a great calendar? Yeah, that's probably true to it. And that's why Kronos, and that's why the Jews, the pagan god of the early Jews was El, the planet Saturn. And he's the god of Kronos, measurement and time. He's a god of the seasons and planting and life and death. That's why he's shown eating children. Because it's shown that you, when you're born, you're born to die. But you will come back. You know, this kind of thing. That's where that all came from. And a uh, whole old father time with his scythe. You know, that kind of thing. That's where also where the Green Reaper comes from. But uh, it's just, a, it's just a, you are here for a limited time in this form, but you will come back, just like the trees reform in spring. That's another part of paganism, the, re the secular nature of the universe within natural law. You, there's nothing, no scientist or any, any Abrahamic can do to make that maple tree there get its leaves back in December. Nature will do it, natural law. Very important. That's a big part of being a pagan. Another part, magic. The belief in magic. That they're unknown force to the universe. And more importantly, you can alter them. I have practiced magic since I was a kid. I can tell you it works. It got me out of Ballymun Flats. And it got me into places and things I wanted in my life. It's the reason why you're listening to me now. Okay? I'm not... St I don't... I, it's the reason why I... With all the... And people like me... And the reason why memes are more powerful than a propaganda machine, that's magic, okay? Because why, what, what is that? The, the application of natural law in order to do the will. And the will must not be profane. It must, I'm making these videos in this, in, in this world right now to try and make your life interesting. And I'm, having an, I'm not telling you how to live. This is an open dialogue and discourse and conversation we're having. That's a big one. And then reincarnation, of course, that ties in with natural law and natural cycles. And then you're really, then you're on your way, then you're, you're basically a pagan, you have a pagan mind. And then you can go and explore if your ancestry is Celtic, you can explore Celtic mythology and learn from things like that, if you're Greek, Hellenic. But if you, but, but I'm just as fascinated by Hinduism and uh, Slavic gods or Nordic gods. And well, no, I do have Nordic ancestry. But, and, and, and even things like, I'm getting more interested in things like Indonesian and, and, and Southeast Asian pagan archetypes. So it's just it's the beauty of it, you know. And I, I, I don't, you know, I will, you know, I have gone on moonlit walks under the crescent moon in the forest that night. And, and, and in my heart invoked, you know, the power of Diana that if I'm killed tonight, I understand it's a natural law and action. It's the reason why I walked unterrified through the uh, the Odenwald forest in southern Germany. You've all seen a video of me doing it with wolves walking behind me. And I didn't care uh, because I was actually in natural. I was in a state of near euphoria. Uh, and that's it was the most beautiful thing in the world because I was complete as a natural being within natural law and if those wolves had torn me asunder i would have accepted that but it didn't because i knew they wouldn't and i knew that i would i would raise a sea and in in the forest the odin vow the forest of odin and that's how you become that's that's you want to see and you want to go back to a church with a set of rosary beads on your kneecaps going you know i mean that's one of the reasons i'm i'm i think if you are a christian stay catholic and if you're a catholic ignore 
any Catholicism after Vatican II and go to churches where they do the Latin Mass and so on. Because you're actually tapped into... That's the irony of the early Christian churches of Ireland, that when the Vatican really took over the northern, the British Isles and parts of Europe that were part were under the sort of old Christian thing, they actually became more pagan because the previous one was 100% was Jewish. That's what's really amazing about it. Uh, Catholicism actually gave a lot of European... That's why folk Catholicism is something I really, I really value. The whole thing of going to Holy Wells and, you know, Corpus Christi processions and even going up to Pe Croke Patrick on, you know, the Reek, on Reek Sunday. Uh, they're all pagan traditions, but they're also... They're good, natural, you know. They're, they're, they're not... They're, they shouldn't be seen as punishment. They're these Christians, the Catholics, who do things on their... You know, this, I think that's the cathedral. I think it's called St. Andrew's in Montreal, which are St. John's. They go up uh, on the steps on their knees. That's that's madness. Flagellate. That's madness. That's not. That's against natural law. You don't punish yourself when you go to Week Sunday. You don't do that to go. I'm suffering on behalf of Jesus. You go to Week Sunday. Say Jesus Christ. Look at this view of Clue Bay. This would have never happened if I stayed at the bottom of the mountain. Isn't that incredible? That's what. That's 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 being a pagan. Now, so I could talk for 10 hours, like I say, and you don't have 10 hours, and I don't do I, because i gotta, I got to get live in the real world, because you can be a pagan and live in the real world. So some recommendations of books that don't, won't make you a pagan, but will, will help illuminate or s supplement this video that we're watching. One of them is the called Stolen Magic, the symbols, the symbolism, uh, sorry, Pagan Symbolism in Christianity by Peter Knight. This one. A very nice man. I met him recently in England. This book is basically shows you that everything you think is Christian is actually pagan. Okay, it's very accessible, very readable. It's full of lovely color and black and white illustrations, mostly color illustrations. It's a good book. It's one of those books you hold on to when you look up on there and again. So that stolen images, pagan symbolism and Christianity by Peter Knight. Okay, that's the first one. The second one to understand how the Roman Empire became Christian. And the, and the atrocities that were committed, I've mentioned it many times, The Darkening Age by Catherine Nixwee. This is one of the best books I've ever read, okay? It's a, she's an Oxford scholar who goes about showing how the, the pagans were, what the, you know, it's, it's in there. And it's not, it's, it's not pleasant reading if you're a Christian, but you have to understand the history of Christianity in the early days is absolutely... And although a sense of a crusades, the, it manifests destiny. There's nothing, the genocide started here of anyone who wasn't Christian, okay? It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's a captivating read. Now, another one, and this is one of my favourite, favourite books, God's Philosophers, How the Medieval World Laid a Foundation of Modern Science by James Hanam. This one. This is, this is a book I absolutely love. Now, this book... It's very interesting, and it shows. You see, because I'm not, I'm not a Christian or a Muslim. I can read books by the other side, and not go. This is devil craft. This is the devil's book. I don't read the devil's book. See, pagans don't have cancel culture, so we we dip into the other side to learn things, to expand their minds, to learn knowledge. We 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 would have discussions, you know, with pagan Christians and so on. And this book is about how basically. Following this period, this period, right? These guys arose within the church in the Middle Ages and they basically took what was the magic of the pagan world and converted it into natural philosophy. And they took the sort of pagan sciences and Christianized them to eventually become what we call modern science. So it talks about how alchemy was pushed out and didn't fall out of fashion. It was it was discarded. That's why poor Isaac Newton had to burn all his alchemical papers to avoid being sent to prison. It's why Gal Galileo, you know, had to be brought for the Inquisition and say, and so it moves. It was why Copernicus and the rest, you know, all the other, you know, the, 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 the heliocentric... Uh, universe the trouble they had to go to to actually own you know but also the catholic the catholic church then see catholicism gets a bad rap in the sense that they are pro-science catholic it's the it's the cost of, but they they have to own, they adapt the science to to sit in with their their world beliefs but you see he's measuring the globe see what i'm saying about christians and measurement the measurement of form this is how the abrahamic mind this is the great he's actually doing the great reset is that any different than the Fabian Society? 
this med medieval this the thing the fabian society smashing the earth into ha in the shape of the hammers you see we learn we read so there you go stolen images by peter knight the darkening age by Catherine nixie and god's philosophers by james ha uh, james hanam okay so Three, three reads I would start with. But if you just want to do one, I'd say the Peter Knight book is a good one. Because then you can kind of like, after that you say, okay, Christianity, <laughs> I should be a pagan, basically, really. And the other two are just like, kind of like, if you want to know more about the in-depth history. Well, they're both very, they're all very readable, okay? So I hope you got something from this. Very importantly, if you're a Christian, I'm not trying to convert you. If you're a Muslim, I'm not trying to convert you. If you're an atheist, I'm not trying to convert you. This is your own business. I'm just explaining to you why I am who I am and how I became who I am and why I will until I shuffle off this mortal coil and be reborn again, why I'll remain who, who I am and why I'm very happy and secure in it. And also, um, it's not an attack on Judaism that their religion is somehow nasty. Remember, it wasn't Jews who did this. It was Christians. It was it was evil bureaucratic elements within the Roman Empire that took the Jewish religion and weaponized it. It wasn't rabbis that did it. It wasn't anyone like that. It wasn't Jews that were even involved. They were, these people were actually, the early Christians were despised. They were killing Jews as well. The, the first Christians were just as easy to kill Jews as they were pagans. So it's not an attack on anything Jewish religion. And the fact, like I said, of the three Abrahamic religions, the one I have the least problem with is Judaism because uh, it doesn't try to convert me. There's no evangelism or proselytizing. So, um, so that's why I am the way I am, okay? And uh, deal with it, okay? Uh, take care, sanguine noses. Ave Lucifer and long live the horn gods. Lucifer's a pagan god, by the way, nothing to do with the devil. That's a mistake that Christians made. And uh, learn to be more tolerant of other people's religious beliefs, but also don't believe in this thing that everyone is born innocent and that unconditional love is the answer no the answer is always even if you're a christian or a muslim you'll find it's always natural laws take care